I'm going back today to the questions that I asked you to formulate in the first session. And in this group, and more so in the BA course that I speak, I was surprised to see how concerned you are about getting a job. Uh, so many of the questions were about the future of the translation profession. How can I get a good job? How can I compete against all the translation technologies? What do I have to do to become an interpreter for the United Nations or uh, the European Union institutions? All that sort of stuff. I was really intrigued. Are you that scared of employment? You're living in a country that has an unemployment rate of less than 5%. You all get jobs. Come on, my students in Spain have an unemployment rate of 24%. And for young people, it's 50%. They're scared. They're worried about getting jobs. You here have the luxury of coming to a university for how long? Three years? Four years? Five years? And exploring ideas, exploring the world, engaging in intellectual activity. How dare you be worried about getting a job? I mean, okay, you'll get there. There are lots of jobs around, perhaps not just in translation and interpreting. There are far better things. No, don't tell anybody that. Don't tell anybody that. But there are other things you can do. Anyone with communication skills and languages can work in today's Europe, in this part of Europe at least. Okay? Uh, so please enjoy your time here. Don't worry so much about um, preparing yourself immediately for employment. As I tell my students in Spain, if they're good, I say, you look, you have to travel because you, you, it's going to be hard here, okay? They come and take the jobs in Vienna that you don't want. Uh, but I also say, look, you've got until the age of 30. If you've got more than 30, if you're more than 30, sorry about this. But until the age of 30, experiment with things. Go out and get a job, get experience, travel, fix up your languages on the road. Uh, but let experience train you more than sitting in a classroom in a university. Okay? That's my one piece of personal advice, uh, which probably upsets everybody who asks those questions. However, as chance would have it, that is one of the very few questions for which I have some answers. And the reason why is because of a study that I, uh, with a group of economists, uh, did in 2012 for the Directorate General for Translation of the European Commission. And it was published as a report here, and later published as a book over here. You don't have to read the report, and you don't have to buy the book, because I'm going to tell you what's in it. Okay? And indirectly, it should answer some of your questions, or respond at least to your doubts about employment as translators and interpreters, but mainly as written translators, as we'll see, uh, in Europe. Okay? Uh, the project was done for a particular client. They had six questions which we had to address. I'll come to them one by one. Our procedure was to look around at all the research that had been done prior to us. So it's not original research, it's looking at all the information available in the various languages and by the various research uh, institutions and associations in Europe. We also contacted nearly 100 experts and informants to get their advice and opinions. We contacted 139 translator associations, of which 103 are in European member states. There are lots of associations around, and that's one of the things I'm going to look at. Uh, we took one of them, uh, one of their surveys in depth and analyzed it in economic terms. Now, why should the study of status be done with economists? I'll try to explain this now. It's a little bit of economic theory, but I think it will appeal to you. It's called adverse selection. Auf Deutsch ist das auch adverse selection. 
It comes from a paper done in the 1970s by Alakoff, and it's about buying a car. Have I mentioned this to you previously? No. Good. Have you ever bought a second-hand or used or pre-loved or pre-owned car? I have in my life many of these things. And you will understand the anxiety, anxiety of the purchaser because you're not a mechanic and I'm not a mechanic and I have no idea of knowing exactly what I'm buying. Okay, it looks really flash on the outside. The paint works great, and, uh, and you know everything's clean and beautiful. And, and the salesman is telling us, "Yes, it's going to last forever," but you don't know what's under the bonnet. You don't know what mechanical problems are really there. Okay. Now, back in the 1960s, okay, uh, when people buy a translation, it's like that. Why? Because they come to you because they don't know the languages. You're the expert. You know what's good and bad in your translation. You know where you have doubts, but they don't know. Okay? It's like the car salesman knows more or less how bad that car is, but you don't know. So what do you do? Do you tell your client, well, actually, I had some doubts about this one, or I didn't know here, and I was guessing over in this. No. You say it's perfect. Okay, remember the thing about quality? Qual everybody does 100% quality because there's no reason to... You're not going to say, oh, it's only 80% quality. It's like the, the car salesman. No, it's perfect. It's going to be wonderful. Salesperson. You lie. Everybody lies. I love this. It's a model of communication according to asymmetric information. Two people are discussing, negotiating, and one person knows more than the other. Information is asymmetric. We're not equals. One person knows more about what's in the translation than the other. When you're selling a translation, though, it's asymmetric in two ways. You know more about the problems and the difficulties of the translation, and you're not going to tell that. The buyer of the translation knows more about the true value of it what they're going to do with it, where they're going to put it, how much money it's going to generate for them. Otherwise, you know, they have every interest in paying you less than the translation is worth to them. So there, they know more about their field than you know about your field, and this asymmetry works both ways. They know about the pricing, they're going to pay you less than you're really worth, you know about the translation, you're going to pretend it's better than it really is. Okay, and so we have this conversation, everybody lies a bit. I like this model of communication. It's closer to social life than theories of communication like Habermas, for example, where, where he insists that the ethics of communication is tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. Do not lie. You cannot have a society based on people lying Economists have known since the 1970s, all societies are based on people lying. But you can't lie a lot. You can lie just enough for the negotiation to proceed and a reasonable price to be established. Now, what happens when you have extreme asymmetry? The person buying the car has no idea about what's in it, and the person selling it has no reason to tell anything like the truth. Okay? It's just back in the 1960s. What happens is, buying a car is a high-risk operation. Your chances of getting a good car are perhaps, I don't know, one in three, one in four. So, what happens? You don't pay so much. The price of the cars goes down. Not just for the bad cars, for all the cars. The price goes down because there is lots of uncertainty in the market. I talked about risk analysis, didn't I? I'm talking about it again here. Now, when the prices go down, good cars that are going to last for another 20 years logically don't go on the market. People are not going to sell them. They'll keep them for longer. 
So the market for used cars goes down and you've only got bad cars. And because they're all bad cars, the prices go even lower until it's a market for rubbish. Okay, you get this, this vicious circle going and it spirals down, rubbish. Good cars don't go there, people keep them forever. This is what is called market disorder. Okay, or adverse selection. Adverse selection is that only the bad things enter this market. Good things don't. This model is of interest because it's what's happened in the translation market in the last decade in certain countries. In certain countries, um, Argentina is often cited as one of them. Okay, and in certain language combinations as well. Everyone pretends they're a translator. Nobody trusts any translators. The prices that translators are paid have been going down. Good translators, therefore, look for another profession or another job title, which is more to the point. And so you get uh, a downward spiral in the translation market. That is failure. That is uh, very negative. That is the opposite to what we would expect in professionalization. Professionalization means we have only good translators recognized as being good translators. Everybody trusts them. Everybody pays them high prices. And bad translators don't get into the market. Over the past 10 years, the tendency has been to adverse selection rather than professionalization. Okay, and that's the problem we're dealing with. Do you understand the problem? Have people talked to you about this? Some of, some of the questions here, oh, my, my professor said we're not going to get paid well as translators, so I'm going to give up. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there's a market problem there, and we can do something about it if we are good cards or good translators. What can we do against market disorder? In the used car market, the solution was in the 1960s to have certification. You had people get together, get mechanics to check the cars, and you get a little sticker on your car saying exactly what we know about it, and they're not allowed to lie because there are penalties if they lie. What did this do? People became well, people grew to trust the signal of what was inside the car. They didn't, still don't know what's inside it, but they have a signal, this certif certificate, that they trust and which tells them what's inside the car. And the more they trust that signal, the more money they will pay, the higher the general price for all cars, good and bad, and the more good cars enter the market. What's the message? How do you repair, how do you fix up the translation market? You get good signals of quality. And that's what status is. Okay? Status is not how well or badly you translate or interpret. Status is the signals you have about how, how your, your quality. All right? So status could be, could be what? The way you look. It could be your degree from a prestigious institution like the University of Vienna. It could be your years of experience. It could be a professional exam that you have passed. It could be your membership of an association, a professional association. It could be word of mouth, friends of friends. Somebody, you have a good client, they like you, they tell the next person about you being a good translator. And that's actually the one that tends to work more in the translation job and when you buy a car. Uh, certainly in Spain, if you're buying a car, you ask around your friends, do you know anyone who's selling a car? And then you trust the friend of a friend of a friend more than you trust any other signal. But that's only in Spain, perhaps. The importance of certification uh, is obvious in, in websites like this. This is CTP, Certified Translation Professional. I must admit, I used this as an example to present the theory. 
uh, about how easy it is to get some certification. Okay? You don't have to come here for two, three, four, five, I don't know how many years in order to get certification. You can go onto this website, read the materials that are there, do an online exam, and you get a certificate. And I think it costs $120, which is about 100, and, well, the euro is really low, about 130 euros. There you go, done. Well, it might be 200, I, I, I can't remember, okay. But it's, it's not much. And um, uh, there you go. Not only do you get it, you get, if I remember correctly, hold on, gives you credibility when approaching clients, right? That's what you're buying, credibility. I can't remember. One of them gives you, no, this was the place in Argentina. It gives you not just a certificate, it gives you an email address belonging to the Professional Translators Institute, I can't remember very well. And it gives you a letterhead to put on your letters. Uh, and you look really, really good. Uh, you do have to pass an exam, and I, the exam might be quite difficult. I really don't know. Okay? But what's interesting is the same website has an L store, language store. This is when you're setting up your translation business. And look what you need for your translation business. You need free online services. You need a database of agencies database of trade, desktop publishing, and certifications. It's one of the things you need to set up your company, okay, alongside the CAT tools that they've got there as well. All right, so certification is a commodity. Signals are something you can buy, and people sell them. I don't know, it's not very expensive for you to come here, is it? But I guess you pay something, so somebody is selling a signal to you. You're buying that signal, all right? Now, signals are valuable. How do we know they're valuable? Because they get stolen. It's a definition of value. If it's, if it's worth something, somebody likes to steal it. Look around on the web, you'll find the translator scammers directory. And this is a list of how many? Does it say there? Hmm. 3,560. There you go. People who have been caught stealing somebody's CV or signals of status. That is, pretending to be a certified translator or a qualified translator. Basically, they'll take somebody's CV, if you put your CV online, selling yourself as a translator, somebody can take that, keep your name or change the name and put their address, okay, which can be a Gmail account, so we don't know where it is in the world, and then, what do they do? They sell machine-produced translations, Google Translate output, as if it were a legitimate translation, and receive the money using your signals. Okay? 3,560 3, is a lot of people doing this. So it must be worthwhile. Okay? And of course, for many language combinations, the clients don't know what they're buying. And so they pay the money. That's like buying the car. And this is the best in indication I have of market disorder. Here's an example of, of what they're doing. This is the American Translators Association so certificate. The ATA exam is hard. If you pass that exam, you are a good linguist. I don't know if you're a good translator, but you know your languages very well. And in the United States market, you will get paid more if you have the ATA certification. So this bit of paper is valuable. Uh, so somebody has crossed out the real name and put in a false name, and they are now certified. Happily, the ATA database has a list of all people who, are, who have passed the exam. So it's easy to check who has got it and who, who hasn't but people tend not to check all the time. The problem is, I went to that database. Here you see Mr. Bin Lee is supposed to be the one who's got the real certificate, and I couldn't find him in the database either. So it might be a scammer who's stolen from a scammer. I don't know. Okay.
lots of the scammers, I, we did a study of, of the website, and we did a sample and looked at it in some detail. Uh, lots of the scammers are really from countries where there's not much else to do. Okay, they have some English, they have IT capacity, uh, you know, they, they can be in Senegal or, uh, or Ghana or Palestine lots. Uh, okay, these, these guys are using their skills to get some money. Uh, they're doing it illegally. The best thing is, well, be careful about putting your CV online, and making it known to the world. Don't put your certificates online and make it easy for people to steal them when you've got it. But also, it'll tell you why people tend to trust word of mouth and other networks uh, rather than the signals that we have. The good news is, it tells you that the signals of status do have real value. That's why they're worth stealing. Your interest is, what is the relative value of a degree? In your case, a master's degree. Okay. Well, it depends. When we started this research, we believed that in no country in the world was a translator or interpreter a protected title. Protected title means like a doctor or an architect or a lawyer. You can only exercise this profession if you have a university degree. Okay? That's not the case for translation. Except we discovered in Slovakia. Hooray for Slovakia. Slovakia has a law which says you do have to have a university degree in order to pay taxes as a translator. A translator, interpreter. But then you read the law and it says a university degree or so many years of residence in the country of the other language. So experience can compensate for it in some circumstances. Okay, But for the rest of the world, including Austria, nope, it's not a protected title. Should it be one? Well, that's something we have to debate, and we can talk about that if you're interested. Employers, the employers that we contacted and the surveys that we looked at, employers recognize um, the status of uh, a diploma from the Institute of Linguists, the Chartered Institute of Linguists in the United Kingdom, which has public exams, which everybody can sit, uh, they recognize very much the ATA certification in the United States. In Germany, the Diplom Übersetzer, which is now something else because it's a master's, is recognized, has a value, and employers do ask for it. Okay, so it's up there. And uh, I should add, in Australia, NATI certification, they have a national uh, accreditation authority, uh, that is also recognized. So some of them do. But the Diplom Übersetzer, or the equivalent now, is the only one that we can find in the world that really does have that status. Although it depends a lot on how much the employers know about the training process and the places uh, where it's done. For example, in the United States, there is only one really well-recognized tra tra um, training institute in, in Monterey. And the program's very expensive, and, and that is a good signal, simply because there are, there are, there's no practic practically no competition yet, although other places are starting up. The interest is that most employers, especially big employers, don't trust anyone. They will do their own testing. So after you do your MA here, you go and apply for a job in Brussels or Luxembourg, the translation service or the SKIC, the conference interpreting service, and they will get you tested. You will have to pass their test. Most big employers do this. This is including the very people for whom we did this research. They asked us about the status, what has to be done, etc. And we could show them, look, Nobody really trusts academic qualifications 100%, including you. Because they don't care what degree you've got. As long as you can do the job, you're in. They don't care what your degree is in. 
you know, somebody can come along with a degree in engineering or medicine. Hey, I want to be a conference interpreter. Let's see if you can do it. Fine. Okay. So uh, public exams, that is the capacity to do the job, uh, seem to be worth more as signals than the bit of paper you get as such. Uh, since the research was finished, or in parallel with it, I must admit, people have tried to enhance the status of the academic degrees. Uh, the degree you get here is within the EMT, European Masters in Translation Network. And so you not only get a bit of paper, you get a stamp somewhere that says European Masters in Translation. And this should ideally give you a higher uh, purchasing power on the market. Will it really? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's see what happens to graduates. I just note that the number of students in Europe who are getting this label of prestige is very great, and there are no common exams to test who can really do the job. So if you get, let's say, I don't know, Let's say in one year we have 4,000 students graduating as translators or interpreters at master's level in Europe with EMT, and of the 4,000, 50 are bombs, lemons. Lemons are bad used cars. 50 of them really can't do it. Okay? If five of those 50 get into the key organizations and they're found to have the signal but really perform badly, the level of the whole thing goes down. Okay, so my personal opinion is that the EMT network, the the uh, the bringing together of, of prestigious programs, is not enough in itself. I'm personally in favour of European-wide exams for each language combination. That is, your final exam here at the end of the masters should be the same as in all the countries in Europe, doing English, German, or whatever your language combination is, and when you pass that you really can do the job. But then I know that not all trading institutions are as good as this one. Somebody did ask about sworn translators. You say it's Gerich Dolmetschen, but Gerich Übersetzen, does that exist? But the Dolmetsch, all the, the interpreters do written translations as well. So, you know, it's some, something of a misnomer. Uh, now, in most countries, because the uh, legal translators, sworn translators, legal translators, it overlaps. Okay? So, sworn translators, get, I don't know, how do you say that? Get fifth, no. um, if you're a sworn translator, it means you translate it and you sign at the end and you are legally responsible for the quality of the translation and you can only sign because you are a member of the club of sworn translators. Okay? You've got there somehow. All right? Legal translators, just people who translate in the legal field. You don't have to be specially qualified. Sworn translators in Europe, often called authorized translators, um, are protected. It's a closed, closed shop thing. Okay? In most cases, though, that is done outside of the academic institutions. Five countries are the exception to that. And then in other countries, anybody can do a legal translation, anybody at all, and then they take it to a notary who does the stamp and signs. So the certification is not done by the translator, it's done by somewhere else. This is how it looks. Sorry, Greece, is in, Greece has always been in flux. It seems. This is how it looks uh, in Europe. Uh, you'll see that Austria is, is one of the main bulk of European countries um, where we do have authorized or sworn translators, okay, which is a normal system. What's really interesting is that the distribution of the, the um, countries in green allow you to get there by having a, a academic training. For example, in Spain, if you do certain um, courses in, in, in legal terminology and that, and that stuff, 
then you get it and you, you can be a sworn translator in Spain and other countries as well. And then still other countries, the ones in yellow uh, don't have the translators being certified, the translations are certified by the legal profession. Okay, so it's, it's, we have less responsibility in those countries. Austria is mainstream, uh, you do have that. What's interesting is that the distribution doesn't correspond to the distinction between common law and statutory law. Um, you know, in the, in, the, uh, in the British tradition, uh, laws are, are, are established by practice and the actual decisions, it keeps evolving. It's a different legal system. Um, that difference doesn't make, uh, doesn't correspond here. So I assume that the distribution is ultimately arbitrary, which means it can be changed. If anybody in Europe wanted it, we could have it all one color, which would help. Why would it help? Here's an example. I've taken it from Prose. You know Prose? It's an online website association of translators. It's actually good for getting information about what's going on in the industry. Here's somebody writing in. He needs help. I have done a translation from French to English of a diploma from a Belgian university. Okay, so somebody's going from Belgium to study in the United Kingdom, and they have to present a translation of their diploma. Good. And now the client asks for it to be sworn. Okay, somebody has to attest to the veracity of that. So they're asking for a signal. Who's going to give the signal? Now, this is a translator. I'm English and live in England. England doesn't have a system for sworn translators. Okay? The client is, in, is Belgian, living in Belgium, I guess. Well, they went to study there. And I got the work via a Swedish agency, which is sort of normal, because it, the market is European. This is the way it works. Needless to say, I do not know the client because agencies don't let you contact the client. What do you do? Okay, it's just a mess. Uh, the, the, the reality is that the translation market is supranational, international. Okay, but the certification systems, our signals, tend to be national because we have legal systems that are still national on many levels. Uh, so the answer would be, well, the long-term answer is, get a certification system that works for all European countries, have it recognized by everybody, and let's solve this problem uh, for the legal work and the other work. Uh, what's the answer? The British University could contact the Belgian University to check that the degree was issued on the date it was issued. I do this all the time. Okay, and that's quite easy to do. Or the translator could take the translation to a notary in Britain and get it stamped. And that's easy to do too. So there are two possible solutions. The interesting thing is that nobody really knows. Nobody knew how to answer that question. Market disorder. I talked about market disorder. This is market disorder in Europe. What's the roles? What are the roles of translators' associations? Associations, I mean, in, in Austria you have Universitas and perhaps some others. But uh, it, Universitas is one of the associations that does work very well, it seems to me, from the outside. Okay? Looking around at the, at the associations, we find that they have lots and lots of activities, one of which is signaling. For some associations, being a member does help you get clients uh, and does aid your status. Get clients because you're in the list of members and people can check that you're there and uh, often just putting it on your CV or on your publicity uh, increases your standing in the community. Some associations do exams and give certification. Chartered Institute of Linguists, the ATA. In Austria, that doesn't happen, I think. Others are very good on unionization and political representation, lobbying in governments. Uh, Britain has recently been going through um, 
a lot of debate and conflict, the justice system outsourced all of its translations. They gave it to a private company. The private company then starts organizing it on a purely commercial basis rather than quality block, on a purely commercial basis. Okay, we'll leave it at that. And the people who are certified within the old system are protesting. People were boycotting trials. About a thousand trials didn't happen because the interpreters didn't show up. Okay. And the, uh, the associations uh, were at the core of this debate. In fact, two new associations were started up uh, because of this debate. Uh, and, and, and the work of political representation or defense of rights as well. Other associations give information through um, websites, discussion groups, uh, links that are reliable. Others provide training programs, especially in new technologies. Still others work effectively as a job agency, uh, rather like Pros or Translators Cafe, uh, Aquarius, these, these websites. Some associations do that. And there are others in uh, Greece, Cyprus, and Estonia where to be a member of the association, you have to have a degree from a certain university. Okay, so there the, asso the association is um, defending the value of certain diplomas. And you have an overlap between academic qualification and the system of the uh, associations. The other associations don't. They don't care where you did your training or even if you did any at all. I was surprised to find that the associations uh, spread over time, as you can see here, date from the first one prior to 1900 was in Greece, believe it or not, and then others were established. We went through the Golden Age, if you can see here, in the late 50s and 60s, when the main associations for the profession were established. Uh, the one at the top, 10,000, is the ATA. Actually, it should be 11,000 members, the American Translators Association. Interesting. The United States has very little training uh, dedicated to the translation profession, but, but the biggest and probably the most active uh, professional association. That is, lots of the work of the training institutions there is done by the association. The next one is the BDU uh, in Germany. Okay, and the others are all quite small. What intrigued me was that the research finished in 2012 that many associations were being created. In the year 2011-2012, I think five new associations were created. It's, you would think that the signal of an association comes from having lots of members and being there for a long time. ATA, market value, BDU, perhaps market value. Okay? And yet, new associations are starting up all the time. Why? Because of political dispute in Britain, we found that. Also in Germany, we found younger translators were unhappy with the old fuddy-duddies in the BDU, and they wanted something new and exciting with lots of technology and a great website, and they started up a new association. Others, we'll see in a minute, respond to new media and new forms of translation coming on board. In the history of the associations, what you see is the segmentation of the market. In the 50s and 60s, we had large, prestigious associations covering all kinds of translation and interpreting. Universitas was one of those, I think, or was in the 70s, but its idea is that we will cover it all and we will be big and everybody is in it. Okay? In the 1970s, in some countries, France, uh, uh, notably France, but others as well, Separate associations for literary translators. Um, often there's some conflict about rates of pay. You know, literary translators are not paid in the same way or as much generally as technical translators, and they separated out. Interpreters separated out, and you get the AIC, the International Association for Conference Interpreters, and several country representatives of them, and they separate out. 70s and 80s, separation again for sworn and legal translators, when the regimes came into place that I've just mentioned. In the 1980s, we get new associations for regional languages. 
In Spain, you might know, we have Spanish as an official language, but also Catalan, Basque, and Galician. So we had new associations for Catalan, Basque, and Galician. That happened in other countries as well. Welsh, Gaelic, uh, Irish, for example. In the 1990s, audiovisual translators separate out. People are doing uh, uh, subtitles and dubbing. Uh, recognize they have new market structures with new technologies, and they have their own separate associations. And then into the 2000s, we get small interactive groups, um, people who know how to use a website, know how to present themselves well using electronic communication and social media, know how to get a community going on social media. The big associations don't really know how to do that, and so the small ones uh, come in there. What this means is that over time, the associations get smaller, more active, but they have less prestige. The prestige of the association depends on being big and having been there for a long time. Suddenly we get a lot of associations which means that prestige, that signaling power, has been divided up into lots of little signals. Sometimes this is good. I, I actually like the small new associations that know how to use social media. They're doing a whole lot of good work. Uh, I really wish that the big traditional associations could learn from them. And, and, and we get the two things happening together. Because as it is, associations have reduced willfully reduced their signaling power, that is, their capacity to restore market order. What's the message? Somebody asks, should I become a member of the association? My answer is, if it's a good one, yes. That is, if it's going to help you communicate with other professionals, get up-to-date information, and be a mark of prestige on your CV, yes, absolutely. Part of the research, we found previous research that applied an economic model, a guy called Parker, and he would say for every country in the world, uh, he would estimate the price of the market for translations and interpreting okay, in dollars. And then I did a calculation, I went through the countries where you have tax returns, and we could count the number of people who use translation or interpreting as a job category in the tax return. Okay, so I put those bits of information together and I could figure out how many full-time translators and interpreters correspond to a thousand dollars of market value. Okay, it's just, okay, it's a technical thing. And from there I can extrapolate to the whole world market. And I got to the, more or less, 333, I say there are 333,000, exactly, professional translators and interpreters in the world. Which is interesting because the previous estimates were 700,000. So I'm, it's, we're not big. There's not a lot of us. It's a small profession. Okay? And then I can tell you for each country, theoretically, according to the economic uh, factors, how many professionals there should be. And then I can go to the associations and compare how many people are in the association and how many people there could theoretically be in the country. Do you see what I'm doing? Perhaps. And then I get a percentage. I, the countries in red are countries where fewer than 20% of the theoretical population of translators and interpreters are members of associations. Okay? So these are small associations that are not really doing anything with respect to the market. Austria is not in red. You're okay. All right? And then the ones in blue, I found some, some countries where there were more members of the associations than there should be theoretically translators based on economic indexes. Finland, especially. Finland was, they just, everybody wants, they've got nothing to do in these long winters when it's all night time. They translate. Okay. Uh, there seems to be lots of, uh, a great number of part-time and amateur translators who are members of associations and enjoy it. And that would explain the blue in these particular countries where there are more people. 
Okay, and the green is pretty good. 70, uh, yeah, between 70 and 100 percent would be a very healthy association representative uh, representation, and that's what we do find in the Scandinavian countries, except for Finland, uh, Great Britain, and Austria. Okay, uh, which is why I think that the associations here are doing a pretty good job. Their coverage is significant. They can have clout on the market. Okay. Other countries, not at all. What do employers say? I mentioned last week that employers always promise 100% quality, so we would expect that from our model of adverse selection. What do they say about uh, the translator say employee? The general result, looking at prior surveys is that they expect people to have a, a university education, but it could be in anything. Experience seems to be worth slightly more than your education. So if somebody comes in with five years of work in the market, another person has five years sitting in front of people like me, who would you employ? I, I too would go for the one on the market. As I mentioned, the big ones run their own recruiting tests. Uh, but it has to be said that for the big companies in the field of technical translation and localization, uh, there are little signs of disorder. Uh, that is, the signals seem to be working very well. People are, employers are always looking for good professionals. They are lacking good professionals. They tend to pick somebody who's not a good professional and get rid of them very quickly. The market expels uh, bad performers very quickly. And so my conclusion is that in those fields, there are no real signs of market disorder as such. Those are good fields, good markets to enter. Your signals, your status, will be recognized and um, will have some corresponding payment. Okay. Uh, that's, that's really the study. I just want to go through a few small things. Uh, this is Austria. Austria, you're good. Spain is another world. Here's just some newspaper clips. Do you read Spanish? Okay, if you've got it, you'll know that 40 police were interrogated in Malaga for corruption. Nothing new. Two interpreters arrested. One of them accused of selling information. Okay, uh, part of the deprofessionalization of translation and interpreting is, uh, well, the less you get paid, the more interest you have in working for other criteria and other clients, okay, such as selling information. You get lots of, you do get lots of sensitive information when you're translating and interpreting. All the codes of ethics have a clause somewhere saying you shall respect professional secrecy. You know, what you learn from your translation you cannot give out. It's in all the ethics, but the temptation is always there. Three police interpreters sentenced for falsifying national identity or ident identity of immigrants. This is only to be expected because the interpreters belong usually to the same ethnic or linguistic community as the immigrants, the temptation to help people like you is always great. And it happens. Two sworn interpreters arrested for relations with money laundering. Okay, at least these guys were... My, sorry, money forgery. All right. At least these guys got paid. Perhaps not in real money, but they got paid. Trial suspended because Chinese translator does not know Spanish. Okay, this is market disorder. The judge couldn't understand what the translator was saying, so he had to suspend the trial. Okay, this is my favorite coming up. Uh, this shows you how small and, and fragile the market is. Uh, trial suspended because the only translator of Chinese was the accused. So he had nobody to translate for him. Okay. All right, so that's what can happen in, in market niches. 
which are subject to, my, to disorder. Okay, that is, when the payment is high, when you're well paid, there are, uh, it's possible to respect the code of ethics because you don't have to look elsewhere or you don't have to start stealing somebody else's qualifications. But if the pay levels are low, this sort of stuff is going to happen. And people will respect the profession more and it goes down and down and down. Spain's economic crisis has had, among its many negative effects, uh, the community of Madrid, well, first they outsourced their translations to a private company when that didn't work, and it didn't work. We know because one famous example, uh, an illegal immigrant comes in at the airport in Madrid, right? The policemen get him, we need an interpreter. The, the company sends out an interpreter. I don't know what language it's for. Let's say it, I don't know. The policeman asks the interpreter for his, his document, national identity document. He checks it and arrests the interpreter for being an illegal immigrant. I mean, okay. Uh, the company doesn't check or wasn't checking who was in the list of interpreters. So th they were both, you know, they, they now had two illegal immigrants instead of one. Okay. Uh, what do you do? The community of Madrid to solve the problem there are no interpreting services for immigrants. Problem solved. Oh yeah. Uh, or put them into prison. In prison, you've got lots of languages. Interpreting services, zero. Problem solved. Okay. That is the extreme of market disorder. And there are really uh, negative, ethically very negative things happening in Europe, especially on the immigration front. Uh, and they're miles away from the kind of market that you're being trained for. Okay. But there's real political work to be done there, more so than here, more so in the fields of technical translation, uh, conference interpreting, high quality literary translation. You know, comparatively speaking, people can complain, but it's nothing to do with what's happening in Europe with respect to the immigrant community. The recommendations resulting from this report were. Firstly, that a lot has to be done on the level of paraprofessionals, that is, people who are not fully qualified, people who are not highly competent, people whose first competence is not in translation and interpreting, but people who can help, and then immigrant languages, for the reasons I just mentioned. That payment levels have to be high for ethical reasons so that it can be a, a, a profession uh, and you don't turn to alternatives. Address the languages of export and negotiation says uh, that people should recognize that it's in the interest of a community to have uh, members in that community being experts in mediation, uh, translation and interpreting, for the languages needed, okay, export and negotiation. Um, Austria speaks with everybody, you need lots of languages here. Uh, research I'm working on at the moment, um, next door to where I live in Tarragona, Salo, we have um, a sizable community, about five to 6,000 Russian speakers. Okay? And there is no support for their language at all. And we would imagine that in 50 years, Russian will no longer be spoken there. Kids go to school, they learn Spanish, Catalan English, Russians at home, they don't want it. But it's in the interest of the community to have people there who know good Russian. Because Russians, well, until recently, had a lot of money. Uh, they've still got a lot of oil. Uh, it, it's, it's in the interest of the community to preserve the speakers of Russian and to see that they are trained uh, to work between Spanish, English, Russian, for example. So that's what I mean. They yeah, have intelligent policies that can focus on long-term needs, long-term mediation needs. Well, that's not being done anywhere that I can see at the moment. It is urgent to have cross-border recognition of qualifications and certifications. The EMT is a step in the right direction. I think there should be European-wide exams and with really strong signals resulting from it. 
the Transert project is something done at this university, has been done, will be continuing, and I hope it's working in that direction. When you've done that in Europe, that has to be coordinated with the same systems that should emerge or are emerging in the United States, Canada, Australia, and China. And I personally, um, wary. Do you know what wary means? It means I'm not frightened. I just say, be careful uh, about assuming that all academic degrees are good signals of status. I, I often see this. You know, I'm marking a final exam. And if, if I give it a pass, the student is out on the market. Okay? And a pass is what? 52%? What does that mean? That there are 48% were errors? You know, what is the pass grade for? You know, the, the temptation for me as a teacher when the student's been there for five years, I mean, they've been taking the final exam for five years, I want to pass that person and get rid of them. Okay? But I know that if that person gets on the market and that signal reflects badly, it's going to be negative for everyone. Uh, so there is there is always a temptation to um, give academic degrees on criteria that not, are not wholly professional. Let's put it that way. Okay? And I know that does happen in some parts in Europe, and that's why I am wary. People have been talking about professionalization for about 20 years for translators and interpreters. And the model of professionalization, um, as you can put it here, says we should be heading towards a situation where we are like doctors, lawyers, architects, certified accountants, chartered accountants. Right? Okay. Uh, that we should be the people who are employed because of the degree the public exam, and the membership of the association altogether. But there are many other professions there. Look at where teachers, social workers, nurses are. Okay? They're not there, but they're heading part of the way there. And then you have marginalized occupations, foster parents, child care providers. Do you have, I don't know what happens, Kinderkripper? Yes, in Germany we send them to somebody who takes in kids. I, my, I was in Germany when my kids were small, so I found out about, about that. And they don't have any particular qualification. Some of them do and uh, pretend to be a bit better, but is it really required? Uh, not usually. Okay. This was done by researchers working with sign language interpreters for deaf, hard of hearing. And, um, and they figured that, that the current status was there and they were working out ways of moving up that way. If you put in the entire translation profession, I would suggest some, of the, some are down marginalized. Immigrants in Madrid, for example. Okay. People do it because they like to help out. Often they're volunteers. Okay. Uh, some are, are, are pretty good, fully professionalized. Um, ATA top flight uh, conference interpreters and things like that are getting up towards there, but most are with the emerging profession category. Teachers, social workers, nurses. And one of the arguments that has intrigued me is the following. I may have told you about it. Uh, this was an American at a conference years ago. He said, yes, the problem is that there's this category of the nurturing professions. To nurture is to help somebody grow up, okay, is to help somebody. And these are professions where the reward is in the activity itself. As a teacher, I know the reward of my teaching task is never the pay packet. It's seeing somebody learn and you help them learn. You always remember the, the worst students that actually progress because of something you did. You forget the best students. Okay? And that's it. You do it because you love doing that. And that's true. That's for teachers across the board. Social workers help people. Nurses enjoy helping people. That's why they're underpaid. Because they get the reward in the good feeling they get. Okay. 
The argument is translating and interpreting is one of the nurturing professions. That we do it because we enjoy helping people out. And because we feel so good about that, we don't really need a lot of money. Good argument? No, it's a terrible argument. Because I can show if you don't pay us lots of money, we become unethical. Okay, that's that. Uh, but socially, it seems to work. Socially, sociologically, about 70% of the profession are women. And at the moment, I have two men in front of me. Two men of about 60 women. Okay, so it's even, the percentage is even greater here. Okay, it's a highly feminized profession. And this is one of the things that feminism has had to combat, this image of women as being nurturing and therefore not fully professional and not having to be paid so much. So we're in that argument as well. Coupled with that, we find that about 60% of us work part-time, combining translation with teaching, as, as I do, uh, interpreting sort of the same profession for me, uh, editing, writing, other things like that. That's very common. Okay? If you're doing something part-time, it tends not to be perceived as fully professional. Do you have a part-time lawyer, a part-time doctor, a part-time architect? Not usually. Okay? And then about 74% on our survey uh, are working freelance. That is, we work for ourselves, we are self-employed, we don't work for a big company, we don't have a regular uh, yearly salary, for example. Again, how many, well, lawyers perhaps they are self-employed, uh, but most doctors, for example, would not be uh, self-employed to that extent. Actually, I have to review that. Perhaps, perhaps there are, perhaps that's not a, a big criteria. What's interesting is that uh, Michael Gold, a sociologist in, in, in the United Kingdom, did a study with Janet Fraser of people who moved from in-house employment, in-house means you work for a big company, to freelance employment. Okay, they, 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 they got thrown out or the company closed or whatever, for whatever reason, they became freelancers. And they find that the people who become freelancers stay freelancers. They don't want to go back. Uh, that for the people we're talking about, this community of 333,000, Freelancing is a very valid option. It gives lots of capacity to work this week, not work this week. Uh, look after your young kids at home while you're doing some translating and they're asleep. Uh, take, it off, take years off work and then come back into it. Freelancing and part-time work gives a lot of freedom, which seems to be appreciated by this community, perhaps because most of us are women. Okay, that last link is a question. It's not a fatality. But it seems to fit in with the figures and it seems to fit in with the social perception. So if people are worried about us not being a protected title or not having a 100% you know, exclusion of non-professionals, I suspect the answer is partly in the signalling but also partly in our own sociological makeup. Uh, we are largely feminized. We do benefit from that in terms of freedom and, and our capacity to put together our own careers. And part of the deal is that we have to accept we are not one of the closed liberal professions. It may not be a bad thing to stay where we are, more or less. Okay. Um, I don't know how much, how much patience you have with me here. i just point out some interesting evidence that, that we find that sort of corroborates the kind of thing I'm saying. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist, did a study of publishing, French publishers. Okay, it may seem to have nothing to do with you, but wait a minute. And he found that the publishers use translations in, in very different ways. And this is a map, you can't see anything in it, but it's a map of the publishers in France. And they're organized according to their typologies. Okay, and 
Basically, up here, you have very big publishers established in Paris, who are big companies, employ in-house translators, and they translate bestsellers. If something sells well in English or German, they'll translate it into Paris and pay the translation rights. And that's a translation market working. Stable? Fine. And down here, you get lots and lots of little publishers, of whom, well, usually with one or two or three employees, the head of the company is usually a woman, they are not in Paris, they tend to be in the south of France, and they use translation, there are no in-house translators, translators are usually friends, friends of friends, and they translate for minor literature, and they translate things that the translators want to do. The translator will come in and say, I've got this great author, I really want to translate them, publish them in French, Shh, you can do it. Okay? That is, you look at the market, translations up there are one thing, in-house, big, stable, and down here, a social activity, often between women, and enjoyable, a source of pleasure. Both are legitimate. And Bourdieu's attitude at the end of that study is very clearly in favour of the second. He says the true values of literature and literary communication are there with the use of translation as part of an ongoing social activity. And those small publishers usually have direct contacts with small publishers in other European countries. There's a network happening there which is very different from the network happening with the big companies in Paris looking at the United States or big publishers in Germany. That kind of study suggests that the market for translators is not just one thing. And the values we seek at one end need not be the values at the other. There's also a trade-off. You can be highly paid and highly professional and work like a cog in the network of inter international capitalism, and or you can be badly paid, have a great time, and work socially with people who believe in the values we are translating. Both options, I think, are valid. Of what kind of sociology we need for translators, but I, those are the terms in which I'm thinking. It's not one thing, and, and I'd, I'd like to focus on one or the other. Uh, and and that the, the goal of full professionalization is perhaps not 100% where we should be going, or not for everybody, they should be going there. For me, it's a question of um, thinking about translation as a cross-border activity, not within one country, and thinking about the rewards that come in more than monetary terms.